Musical Talk, the UK independent musical theatre podcast. When I get that footwear from her, and it's put where it could have been, should have been, right from the start, my power will grow, it will blossom and flow through the world, through the years, and straight to my heart. And now, you, my monkeys, my darlings, yes, it is time at long last for you to do your work. Off you go and mop up the mess. I want that little girl and her mangy little dog. But most of all, I want my slippers! Hello, my pretty, and welcome to this week's episode of Musical Talk. I'm Nick Hudson. The voice you heard in this week's opening belonged to the wonderful Hannah Waddingham, who is currently starring as the Wicked Witch of the West in The Wonderful Wizard of Oz at the world-famous London Palladium. As we promised last week, Andrew Keating and I were lucky enough to have a lovely interview with Hannah herself, so you're going to be treated to that this week. Also last week, we played some songs from a new musical playing at the Landor Theatre called Fred and Gladys, based on the uh, the story about uh, Prince Charles falling in love with Camilla Parker Bowles. Andrew Keating and I went to see that musical, and we discussed it afterwards with the show's composer, Paul Tibby. So, we'll start with the interview with Hannah Waddingham, and then go straight straight into the interview with Paul. Musical talk. We're here backstage uh, this afternoon in the world famous London Palladium as the announcement now goes. How cool is that? Absolutely, so you don't well, mistake it with any other <laughs> not world famous London Palladium. We're backstage, we're in the newly renovated. Oh, well, the newly Val renovated. Is really it's really very gorgeous. It's beautiful, isn't it? Beautiful, isn't it? Absolutely, absolutely. And we're here with the very lovely Hannah Waddingham. Hi. Hello. How Hi. are you doing? Musical talk. Good, very good, very good. Loving, loving being here. I love the Palladium. Who doesn't? Well, it's yes. magical. Especially since it's kind of hit 100 and it's had this redecoration. Yeah. And oh, Andrew's gone for it. Look at it. It's beautiful. <laughs> I mean, just as we look round, I mean, it's kind of framed. Lots of beautiful framed posters are just everywhere. Which I'd quite like to steal. Obviously, I won't, listeners. No, try not. <laughs> <laughs> I'd blow my cover if I do now. Have, I? <laughs> have you recorded the thing on the BBC lately about the variety in the history of the variety because this is the, the world of variety theater, yes and it's yeah. a fascinating documentary yeah, it's we, glorious. We, you watch that as you well. mean you get time off do you know what the brilliant thing because we have three matinees we do wednesday matinee saturday and sunday we get sunday night and monday night off it's lovely oh. hooray what which i need because it's knackering this is the thing, it's a very, very energetic performance. I mean, it's my own fault. Mm. I've made a rod for my own back because I just think that's how she should be. She should be absolutely maniacal. Well, you fly in from every entrance available in the theatre. Yes. Um, that was me saying to them in rehearsals, because the one I do from the Dome was meant to be a voiceover. And I just kept, literally from week one, tugging on their t shirts saying, can I, um... No, Hannah, you can't. Can... Next but week, can I, um... No, you can't. It's too expensive and too dangerous. But which of O'Brien did it in the opposite? In... Well, exactly. That was my... But they said, they said, no, we can't have you doing that because we then need you back on stage. And then it was made obvious that this one bit, you know, the Surrender Dorothy bit, was meant to be a voiceover. And I thought, ah, now, you can't say that I need to be back on stage because that's the end of Act One. Mm-hmm. So... We and it's then. a great moment when you suddenly come down from the dome because you're not expecting it. You're like, <gasps> exactly. Oh, there she but is. But I actually also did it. One, I want to be able to say to my grandchildren, "Oh, we're flown in from the dome, the London Palladium," and so it's complete, utter selfish vanity. Um, but also, I just thought, whoever plays this part in future, you have to have the witch in the audience, so that children think, "Oh my God." That, you know, it, it, it's completely different from flying behind the prosage. There's a safety for kids with that, or for adults. But once I've been in the auditorium once, who knows where she might come from next. And also there's another show sort of linked to The Wizard of Oz, which has a very, now, should we say, iconic flying scene for um, which one's that? the end of Defying Gravity. Oh, yes, yeah. 
it's not the flying. sequel. Well, it's not <laughs> flying, they're in a cherry picker. <laughs> I know, and, and so this show has gone beyond that yes. and given the audience a lot more, yeah. I think, as regards to your, your stunts. Good, I'm glad you think so. <laughs> but as you said, you've made it quite a tough act to follow now, you see. Oh, I don't know. I don't know about that. I just, I just think it was hilarious when my two understudies were told that suddenly we're going to be flying in from the dome. One of them came up to me and went, oh, thanks, Han. <laughs> and I thought, oh, God, I didn't think that through at all, that other people would have to Again, do it. Can she just fly? We'll, we'll walk yeah, in. Yeah, yeah. We'll do it from the wings, thanks. We'll walk from the audience. <laughs> yeah. And are you now going through all theatrical witches and playing them all? I know. One well, by I'm one. trying to not be insulted by... What can I say? You're going to do all three leads in Witches of Easter Eggs. I know, I know. Yeah, I'm going to do it like a kind of uh, 39 steps. <laughs> Just like <laughs> Every witch <laughs> in musical theatre. Because we, because the last thing we saw you in, of course, was Into the Woods at yeah. Regents. Have your Regents arms recovered? Party. Again, a, a hugely energetic performance. I know. And they didn't tell me. I was cast back in the January last year. We started rehearsals in June. And they decided to tell me on day one of rehearsals, not giving me time to actually get fit. Tim Sheeter said, oh, we'd like to have you on crutches. I laughed, thinking he was joking. And he said, no, 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 we, we, because we need to get rid of your height for that ah, first bit. Ah, the height, yes. You know, because I needed to look like this craggy kind of tree mm. woman. And I thought, are you kidding me? So I literally went that afternoon with our uh, co-director and movement director, Liam Steele, and we we just looked at how I might be able to move without it looking like Planet of the Apes or something. It reminded me of Lord of the Rings. Yeah, exactly. Um, but they wanted to get that gnarled, kind of debilitating illness thing so that once the, the sticks are gone, I stand up to my full height and she's this younger version of herself. So I got, I got what they were doing and believe me, I went through serious back and arm pain but ever since then, I'm strong as an ox, I tell you. We're seeing some big muscles on display here <laughs> for those that can't see. But, and uh, this job as well. I, have to- I don't know what, what it is, whether it's carrying my broomstick or going from the basement, because I, I fly in to the stage level and then have to run up the full height of the building out onto the roof and then back in through the dome. So it's like having a Stairmaster class every night. We're going to wait for your fitness video. <laughs> Crazy, imagine. See it coming soon. In my prosthetic nose and chin. <laughs> you too can look green and haggard. <laughs> but for those that didn't see you in Into the Woods, I believe a digital release is coming out. Yes, which is on digitaltheatre.com. Yeah. yeah. I think it's something like nine, ten pounds. Download the whole thing. And we had various multicams over two or three nights of performance. Um, and it rained. Yeah, yes. <laughs> Actually, do you know what it didn't for those, thank God, because it was our penultimate show and the night before that. Um, and actually, one of those nights, Stephen Sondheim came early on in the run, but he wasn't meant to come back again, but he loved it so much that he flew back uh, with his partner and came to, to see it again. So, Be you know, aware everyone, of that everyone, oh yeah. Yeah, because he'd, he'd be around and saying hello and... And, uh, Change that bit. Yeah, yeah. No, he was he was just lovely. Of course, I'd met him doing a little night music, so uh, it was really lovely to see him again. I know when we were there, I think we saw Tim Burton in the audience. And we had oh, yes. And we were like, film. Is, he, is it film? I know. <laughs> film. I know. And actually, as soon as I came out, I did that first. You know, the greens, greens rap. Came out, looked up, and I thought, you know, I mean. Let me tell you, as an actor, you think of plenty of things while, while you're saying your lines. People who say they don't, they're lying. It's a fact. If you're in a long run of something, your brain does think, oh, shall I get two sweet potatoes at the supermarket or four? Um, yeah, exactly. But uh, I looked up. First person I see, I thought, gosh, that looks like Tim Burton. Then I looked up again and thought, oh, my God, it is. Oh, and there's Helen Bonham Carter. Oh, and there's their children. And there's Helen Bonham Carter's mother. And I just thought, wow. And then my brain was going... Are they doing a film? Are they going to? Who are they going to? They use? Have to ask me. <laughs> yeah. Now in Oz, though, again, you get to steal the show with your big, big number, which is one of the oh, new songs uh, with Andrew Lloyd Webber. The and, Red uh, Shoes Tim Blues. Absolutely. Yes. Although I wanted it to be called "You're Welcome, My Pretty." Well, I, I do have to say, Nick has been moaning. Well, it's not blues. You can't call it blues. But it's but it because it, it, it sounds right, Nick. That's why red shoes well, blues. Well, no, see, I'm. But they're not I'm, blues. No, I I'm 
jury's out on that for me. Because I read about it after. Because she's went... not sad or depressed or anything. She's saying they're coming here without me even having to try and do anything. They are coming to me. And so that's why she has this party celebration thing of thinking, my God, you just made it so easy for me, you stupid little girl. Now, do, do you agree that no one is... There are no goodies or baddies. People just have different wants. Absolutely. And that's what I try to get hold of in Into the Woods as well. They call her the witch, but she's not actually a witch. They call her that. She's a wronged woman, in my eyes. Um, and I think with this... She just thinks, well, hold on a minute. I was meant to have those shoes in the first place. They're my birthright. And my sister got them. Now, they've, now that on my, they're not on my sister's feet, it's add to add insult to injury. It's not even somebody in my family. It's some little girl that's come along and they're on her feet. So that's why I try in Munchkinland to, as soon as I come out of the floor, she's straight on the subject. It's not, oh, oh, my miserum, where's my sister gone? It's, right, who killed my sister? Where have those shoes gone? I'm having those shoes now. And that's the want all the way through. She doesn't care who's in her way, that is what I want. Because our favourite lyric in the whole piece has to be, she's... Pretty, she's clueless and I want her shoeless. <laughs> brilliant. Isn't absolutely, that brilliant? Absolutely, absolutely. That line, I think I spoke to, when he came in, when Tim came into the rehearsal, I went up to him and I think I gave him a great big smacker on the cheeks. I just thought, that's so witty, but still respectful to... It's very Tim Rice. ...the piece. Mm. Exactly, but it's the marriage of the two worlds. And actually, I think, particularly this song, it does make you wonder why I wasn't in the film. And that's great testament to Tim and Andrew. It replaces the jitterbug, doesn't yes. it? Yes. Which is a song not many people know. Yeah, because really it was removed from the original. From the yeah. Mm. One of the well, not problems with the film, but it's always odd that you always think the witch is in it more than she actually is. Oh, she's hardly in it at all. She, yeah, and then when you watch it again, you're thinking, oh. And actually in the book, she's in it even less. When I read the book, I purposely read, because I know the film inside out from when I was younger, I purposely read the book first before I re-looked at the film. Because I think sometimes you can, you can look at visual things and it slightly hinders you because you start doing an impression and I didn't want to get into that. So I tried to take, like I don't know whether you noticed, but I got, them, I got the costume department, the, the props department rather, to make me a long silver whistle that I wear as Miss Gulch. So I have the retractable pince-nez, which is from the film. You know, when she looks at the mm. dog and then pings it back? Yeah. I have that on my jacket, but I also have the silver whistle, which is actually what the witch has in the book to summon the crows and the bees to attack the companions. And even though I never blow it, I wanted it there as a, as a little thing for me, as a little nod to the book. So if anybody comes to see it, that know the book, they can go, ah, ah, look at that. Oh, we know where she's got that. From. Yeah, just we, as a, a little acknowledgement of, of, of the book as much as the film. We did like the fact that um, all the male characters hang... Uh, the farm hands you can mm. see in their costumes, kind of... Like one, of oh, they're brilliant. one has a little tail hanging Yeah, that was, that was David Ganley bit. said, can, mm -hmm. I, can, can you make sure that my cardigan has it attached and hanging down? But Jeremy Sams, our director, has been brilliant with things like that. You know, when, when um, Hickory comes on, who then plays the Tin Man, lovely Edward Baker as Jr., oil is. He, has, he, has, he says, oh, I'll fetch my oil can. But when uh, Uncle Henry says, oh, the storm, someone, some damn fool's locked the storm cellar, he goes, OK, 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 Mr. Gale, I'll, uh, I'll use my axe. Mm. And just little things that ignite it. And the, and the lion saying that he's scared, you know, that um, Zeke saying that he's scared. And, and then this, the guy who plays the scarecrow, Paul Keating, as playing Hunk. He comes in and they say, have you, have you locked up the horses? Oh, well, yeah, I tried to. And then, of course, he refers to that as the scarecrow. So it's brilliant the way all these things that Dorothy hears. And I don't really notice, but on the set of Kansas, we have, there's a broomstick there. There's a bucket of water. There's faded poppies in her wallpaper. Oh, there's a monkey. Now you say it, yes. There's a monkey down by her, uh, at the other side of her bedroom, there's the chest of drawers and it has a monkey doll next to it. A really creepy, you know when you're little and you think, I don't like that doll, it's looking at me and winking. They've got this creepy monkey doll like the phantom there. Thing. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So Jeremy Sanders has been really clever just planting 
seeds. And also, I think what's clever is Professor Marvel's song, The Wonders of the World. There are so many references in that that she then takes in to her dream. It's almost, this brings me on to another a non-musical thing, which I mentioned briefly, but you mentioned all those sort of planting. It's very Agatha Christie-esque. And mm. I was delighted to see you in... Um, yes, the mirror cracked. I with, absolutely with, loved that. With my favourite bedtime story reader, Martin Joris. Oh, gorgeous Martin. We had such a laugh. I mean, he's proper old school, you know. And uh, we just got on like a house on fire. In fact, that whole company of people, you know, there was... Uh, obviously, Dame Julia of Mackenzie, Dame Joanna of Lumley, which who I was beside myself to meet, and then you have gorgeous people like Neil Stook, Martin Jarvis, Caroline Quentin, all these people, Victoria Smurfit, who I've become great mates with, and I felt, when I went to the read through, I thought I feel like I've jumped into my television. Oh, that's what's great about these shows is it's just every so, oh, sort of character and camp actor as you like. And when I went for my fitting, they said, so we'd like you to look like a cross between Rita Hayworth and Jessica Rabbit. And I thought, right, no complaint from me there. You, you did look stunning. Oh, wasn't so. it gorgeous? Oh. And red hair suits you very well. Thank you. Um, and uh, filming in Claridge's, no less. Martin Jarvis and myself in a suite in Claridge's. Not a set, though. I oh, say. No, no, Claridge's. that on your CV. But yeah, I thought, this isn't bad, Martin Jarvis. Lovely. Um, I was going to say, is, is your skin going to survive for the end, for the rest of the run? Because oh. you, you, you know, you, you've got the prosthetic nose, the big hook nose. I have to say, then you green up. It's, it, green? Is a, it is a nightmare, the green, because we can't use aqua colour like they do on Wicked. Um, because I've got the prosthetic nose, which I'll be glued on, mm. and the chin. They they grab colour more than your own skin does. So I have um, a silicon-based airbrush which they do every night. And of course, bear in mind that on a two-show day, I then have to de-green, and it's down to here, obviously, you've seen it, de- down to there. Would you like to say where you're indicating to? Just above my Don't boobs. Know. Yes. <laughs> but there's you're not in a room. <laughs> <laughs> Just to there. Um, <clears throat> I have to de-green to then be Miss Gulch again for a scene that is one minute and 15 seconds long, which sends me slightly mental. But I certainly wouldn't have anyone else playing Miss Gulch because that's... It's you. And also, I, I love playing Miss Gulch just as much as the witch because she is the, she is the germ from which... The witch! Do you get it? <laughs> from from the, where the witch comes from, you know. I want to talk to you about Tonight's the Night, mm. which I saw you in... Gosh, that's a while back. What was that, 2003? And I really enjoyed it. I love that you sound slightly surprised. <laughs> because I, I, I wasn't a fan of Rod Stewart's stuff, and I never really thought, because he didn't write the songs, so no. it, it, it's odd to call it a Rod Stewart yeah, yeah, sure. musical if you have 4,500 songwriters. I do think the songs were very cleverly used, though. They yeah. weren't, you didn't feel that they were shoehorned. I mean, I am careful with what I do, and I'd read the script, and you know, you see where it says, insert blah, 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 song here. And I just thought, okay, you know, things like Young Turks at the beginning and and things like me singing Tonight's the Night, it's because she's making this Faustian pact with, with the boy. And then you have brilliant people like Tim Hower. The voices in it were out of this world. Tim I remember Hower the sound. I remember just... you, obviously, and I remember just how visually incredible it looked. Yeah, yeah, like stunning. Wonderful I actually think set. it got, yeah, amazing. I think it got a really uh, raw deal in the press because there'd already been We Will Rock You, which also wasn't well received. Although, thankfully, I'm so pleased for Brian that they've won, they won the Audience Award at the Olivier's. a very Olivier's. sweet moment, wasn't it? Oh, and Anita, mm-hmm. who's a great, that's how I know Brian so well. Anita's a great friend of mine. Um, her reaction was just gorgeous because she knows that they've constantly had people being a bit rude about it for years and years and it was a real kind of two fingers saying well do you know what there are people that it's like it thank playing. you very much it's still playing to packed houses in a huge and, theater. Uh, yeah, yeah and I thought I thought Ben Elton obviously on Tonight's the Night um, I, I, I think people were a bit harsh about it I mean we still ran for a year but um, yeah Tim Howe and Michael McHale who's just finished in Emmerdale now just brilliant people in it really brilliant people I think it was the jukebox rebellion that it's kind of like, oh, well, it's, if it's a jukebox musical, it automatically can't be any good. Yeah, Whereas, yeah. I suppose you have to look at a show as a show. I think people were about it before mm. it had started. Mm. Um, 
Look at Priscilla Queen of the Desert. That's not done too badly, has it? That's a jukebox musical. And there is a place for it. I think people get really snobby about these things. You're still going to get performers who graft. They're still telling a story. Yeah, absolutely. But you worked with Ben Elton earlier on The Beautiful Game, didn't yeah. you? Yeah. And how do you feel about um, our kind of love being re well, well, Our it kind of love never dies. Me. I think it bothered <laughs> my friends more. I got a couple of phone calls saying, they're using your song, dear. And you just you think, well, sing it no, again. But, but actually, it was originally from what Andrew then called Phantom 2. Um, Kiri Takanawa had sung it in, a, in an original form. And then he used, because Phantom 2, now called Love Never Dies, hadn't happened yet... He then used that song for Beautiful Game. So I haven't really got a leg to stand on, to be fair. And it's actually, the, the structure of it is quite different. It doesn't start with the, uh, the same pattern. No, it, it doesn't start, it doesn't, it doesn't have the, the same da, 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 verse or the... Yeah, it doesn't, it doesn't go into then the, the, the middle eight um, that I had, or the bridge. Um, and, I mean, lovely, Sierra Bow just playing it. Really lovely, and in a very different style, you know, that kind of high soprano thing. And quickly talk about Spamalot. Yes, my beloved Spamalot. In London and Broadway. Yes. So mm. funny, they came up to me, the, the American producers came up to me at the Olivier's uh, in 2007 um, and said, you know, you don't have to answer now, but, you know, we'd, we'd really like you to come do it on Broadway. And I thought... Are you joking? Not answer now. I'd bite your arm off to come and do it. <laughs> How do the audiences compare? They are far more vocal um, and far more people at stage door afterwards out there. It's a real... They just glamorise it more. And I think, I think it's getting more like that here. But uh, I don't know why. They love Monty Python out there. And as much as it did well here... It lasted for a good few years more. Didn't I didn't have the cues as it did. No, oh, God, it was crazy. Out Monty there. Python. Monty <laughs> Python, yeah. The Again, another hugely energetic part. You just come on and then you just don't stop. It's like <laughs> no. Although oh. I only spoke three lines in it. You three sung, or four a lines. sung a lot. All yes. singing, yeah. Yes. Yeah. And you got to the Royal Variety performance, didn't you? Yes. And so you got to show off to the whole of the country. Which this was is what I can do. Great fun. Great fun. With your fake hand. With my fake hand. Oh, my big... God, do you know what? It all kind of morphs into one after a while. I actually have I to get... Have, I didn't have that into the I know, I was one. thinking, wait a minute, when did I have fake, fake hands? Hand? Fake arms? Gosh, when, um, fake nose. When, uh, no. <laughs> we there can is, build a whole new Hannah. Why there do you is appendages. Yes. What's the plural of append- appendage? Appendagium. Mm. Appendagium. <laughs> and then again with night music, you've got to relax a little bit I know, more. I night music. Night music. I have to say night music was particularly thrilling for me because uh, Trevor Nunn and myself and Alex Hansen we were a bit of a kind of little mutual fan club of each other and, and it really clicked and we're, we're actually looking for something to do again maybe next year um, the three of us because it just worked and it's that thing you know when you're in a note session or whatever Trevor would barely have finished his sentence and I'd already be nodding knowing what he meant and that doesn't come around very often I just say I like one of the reviews that kind of said well, she's just a bit too glamorous to do it, really. So Desiree, can you be Desiree, too glamorous? who is, who was the most, meant to be this <laughs> lovely, glamorous Swedish actress. And you just think, right, so you think I look glamorous, yeah, and I definitely look Scandinavian. <laughs> but doing clowns is, like, doing Sending the Clowns is quite a hard song to do, because it's been sung so many times in well, so many different ways. Well, not if you take it ways. back to its, mm. you know, I try to take, take it back to its bare bones, and... And it comes at a point in the show where it is absolutely appropriate for it to come. And people often take out the section where Frederick says, look, I, d- I didn't mean for this to happen. And she just realised, she just thinks, what have you done, you idiot? You've done it again. You've let him crawl under your skin. And, and so I tried to go through every single line and make sense of it for myself and create another line for what that line meant. And... Uh, I had always avoided singing that song, but once I got out of it what I thought it should be, uh, I've never known a song do such strange things to me, and, and Desiree as a part just rippled through my bloodstream very easily and, and felt very homely to me. And I liked to do it, for, I don't know if you saw the Forbidden Broadway at the Menier, when you, yes. you were standing on a box. <laughs> Oh my god, that was brilliant! I'd, uh, people said, "Oh god, don't go and see that," and I thought, "You're joking. That's massively flattering for Invitation them to do that." Yeah, of course form. it is. Of course it is. 
Well, we better let you go and green up Aww. on that note, haven't we? It's very lovely to meet you, boy. Thank you very and much. You. Recorded live at Regent's Park Open Air Theatre. Watch this Olivier Award winning musical in high definition. Just out of reach. Oh, oh, it's all I have to say. Into the woods to live the spell. Into the woods to lose the longing. Into the woods to have the child. To wed the prince. To get the money. To save the house. To kill the wolf. To find the father. To the king. To have to wait. To get to save. To kill. To give. Into the Woods is available to download now. Digital Theatre. Be there. Musical Talk, the UK's independent musical theatre podcast. Well, we've just finished watching Fred and Gladys and we're here with the writer. Hello, Paul. Co-writer. Co-writer, yes. yes. And uh, second night? That's right, yeah. Not in the tower so far? No, no. Well, we haven't had any official response yet from uh, the higher echelons of the society. Palace. No, nothing to come They've back to come. us there. No, 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 no. servants in yet. We're, nothing. we're hoping that, uh, you know, the, 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 the general feel of it is not too, too offensive, but uh, I, don't think there'll be a, I don't think they'll be coming along in person. Well, this is the thing, because Andrew's mentioned Princess Diana, the musical, which is done... Ah. How would you describe that, Andrew? From what I've heard, I think they play it straight. And I've never quite figured out whether... It's ironically. Whether it's ironically playing it straight or whether it's just a kind of an actual heartfelt tribute. It's one of those things, isn't it, where the where the circle of irony goes around and almost meets mm. seriously on the other, other side with that one. I'm not sure. Is that the same one as Princess Diana, A Smile to Warm a Million Hearts or something like that? I don't know. Like it's that. got There's a song in it where, where they sing of Charles. He's a man. He's such a man. Oh. What's in, interesting about the score for this show is it's 90% jazz, isn't it? Yes, there's jazz, bits of jazz and swing, and then and then bits of English music all thrown in, and sort of uh, concert party music. I suppose it's um, the, the the sort of more English side of it. Uh, it's quite good at representing the the stage traditions of the royal family, and then um, as Charles um, develops his. Um, Affection for Camilla, he finds his inner Frank Sinatra, as it were. So you, you can kind of bring out a bit more of the uh, dusty plus some, rhythms, plus some great one-liners and a couple of groan-worthy British puns. Yes, well, I, you know, I'd never, 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 you know, um, turn away a good pun if there's one there. You know, why not? Uh, so obviously your timing is great with the royal wedding just coming up, yes. but presumably it's been in gestation for a long period. It has, so yes. What, what started things off for you? Well, it's just really thinking uh, what a fantastic uh, love story this is. It's, it, it's, it's, uh, I think it will be remembered as one of the great love stories. Great so soap operas yeah, it yes. talks about in the show. Yes, but it, 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 we thought we'd get in there first. I think it will be remembered in, in years to come as the man who... Uh, who uh, had the beautiful young bride, but um, really was in love all the time with, uh, with what, you know, by the time the he was married. Uh, yes, uh, a middle-aged, an ordinary middle-aged woman. I mean, she's, she's thought of as, you know, the ugly old witch, but she's not. She's just an ordinary person. They're an ordinary middle-aged couple in normal circumstances would have been together and nobody would have minded. And the irony is, of course, now they are together. And, um, you know, we've all sort of got used to the idea. And it sets out a very kind of maybe an old-fashioned idea of marriage where things were perhaps a little bit more open and, and it's kind of like, well, yes, this, this is how we're doing things in yeah. our circles, thank you. Yes, well, I think there was a lot of uh, acceptance behind the scenes of, uh, of adultery, but as long as it wasn't you know, out in the open. I think Not we're much more the horses. Yeah, exactly. And I think we're a much more open society now, but the, the, the irony is we went through this awful kind of convulsion of... Um, scandal before we had to come out the other side where we are now. And, and one thing I liked about this show is it didn't make a big deal of Diana's death. It was, you know, Diana was sort of shoved to the side throughout most of it, which was 
made a nice change. We wanted to concentrate on the story of Charles and Camilla. We didn't want to leave Diana out of it because she's very much a part of it, but it was very much focusing on, on their story and how uh, they interplayed together. And of course, we couldn't resist having uh, Diana and Camilla having a scene and a number the, together. The dynasty moment. Yes. <laughs> it just needed, like, you know, people falling down the stairs or a couple of plates to be smashed. <laughs> it was, as I say, it was, it was irresistible, really. But I think they found a certain. Um, way through their relationship there at the end. Now you're only at the land door for how long? Uh, until the 16th. Until the 16th, okay. And then any plans after that? You, are we be Edinburgh or? Uh, no plans at the moment, but we've got a couple of producers coming along to it and uh, hopefully something will... Palace Gardens. I have to say, and your queen was an uncanny dead ringer for Helen Mirren. That's <laughs> yes, all I can yes. see. <laughs> it was really quite like, oh my God. Goodness. But they're all phenomenal, and they, the minute they walk on, you know, right, that's Charles, that's... Yeah, that's... Yes, know. yes, there's, there's, the, we, there's no point pretending. They all walk on as members of the crowd at the, at the royal wedding, but yeah. um, there's really no point in us disguising who they are. And, uh, you know, it's a little moment for everyone to look and say, oh, I see, that's, that's him, that's her. And, uh, Would you like the production to grow? I mean, are you still making changes to the score tonight? Will it be different tomorrow? Do you want to have a bigger production? Not, or? Uh, only unintentional changes to the score, but <laughs> here and there. But... Uh, it, it, it's. I mean, I think we think you've got it in a, in a good state at the moment. But um, if it went on anywhere else, then you know, obviously, there's time for revising. Music is never written, only rewritten. That's Sorry. A musical is never written, only rewritten. That exactly. Yeah. So, so yes, there's always there's always room for changes and improvements. But um, you'll be doing the sequel, the uh, the William and Kate saga. We I think see how it turns out first. I would say, surely. I think I think I've I've said all I want to say about <laughs> royal now, affairs for the time being. What about Fergie? Come on. You're Camilla, you're Camilla again, see, a bit of a dead ringer for the Duchess of York there. She could double up, couldn't she? Yes, yes, I suppose, you know, we could use the same cast and, um, yeah, it's... Um, a couple of years on. Yes. A couple of years on. It doesn't bear thinking about, does it? <laughs> Do you not think Fergie, exclamation <laughs> mark? There's something there, it's got toe sucking, it's got helicopters, it's got, you know... Yes. Are I think you with sailors? Uh, well, it's, it's, yeah, well, I think probably Cameron McIntosh has probably got something in development even now. <laughs> Fergie Blue Eyes. <laughs> yes. well, quite, are you influenced yeah. by Lionel Bart at all as a writer? Uh, yes, certainly. I mean, I think he's probably uh, the greatest uh, English writer of musicals. Um, saying that and thinking, who am I, who am I ignoring there? But um, yeah, I mean, I'm certainly influenced. I think any, any writer, modern writer would be influenced by Lionel Bart. Certainly in his appropriation of English musical. I mean, I love his way he wrote songs that, that, that you thought Oh, that could have come from 1890. Because I could certainly hear him in the title. I hope you don't mind. I could, I could hear him in the title song, Fred and Gladys. Oh, know, right, very yes. Cockney knees up and all that. Well, yeah. I mean, it was a, you, often when you're doing that, you know, you're writing pastiche and you're trying to write another song, really, uh, but different. <laughs> so we were trying to write, you know, something like Show Me the Way to Go Home. Mm. And you got but some different. nice bits of uh, Deb slang in there, didn't you? So the not yes. safe in taxis and oh yes, yes. Well, you know, we did our research. Please with your cast though. Your Charles, your Charles again. See, look, Charles he looks like amazing. he could be a he could be a Windsor reject, couldn't he? Very yes. Much, you think? Well, yes. He's, I mean, he's slightly not quite horsey enough for the Windsors, but um, he needs it's... fake ears. <laughs> yes. Yes, he's, he's, he's a bit lacking in the ear department. No, but he's, I mean, a stunning performance, I think. By, absolutely, by James. absolutely. And, um, yeah, he, he's, he's certainly got that look. He's certainly got that, what I think they call the Guelph look, don't they? So, uh, and yeah. the great little thing with the fiddling with the cuffs. That was a nice you know, little thing he's mm. picked up, and I think he's, doing, he's getting the thing with the ear as well. So a few little touches. It's not an impersonation, but... Um, he, doesn't, again, he, he doesn't sing like him, which is interesting. I've never heard Charles himself sing, but uh, who knows? It would be like that. Yes. Is there a secret album you've got here, Nick? What's Charles' greatest hits. Charles sings. But again, it's just, you realise that, or, or rather you don't realise how easy it is to kind of identify the rules with just simple things like a hairdo. Like Diana, it's the flick of the hair and you go like, right, that's Diana. Or the yeah. blue. Or the pose. Yeah, or something it's the, like it's that. The, it's yeah. the look, isn't it, with Diana? Mm. Yes, mm. it's, uh, it, it's those, those simple touches. That's, you know, that's why I think you can successfully isn't do something boring, like that. It's boring, though. Who's, Diana who's compared to Camilla. Lucas. Yes, well, yes. I mean, the interesting thing with that is the, the whole um, interview with Bashir is, um, is just verbatim transcript. And it gets, uh, probably, annoyingly, more laughs than anything else in, in the show. And uh, it's actually word for word. 
And so I'm guessing no knighthood for you now. That's it. I think you've that, that bridge is burned. Yeah, it was a toss up between you know the um, Evening Standard Award for best musical and a knighthood, and I you know I plumped for the for the. Can't have the award. <laughs> <laughs> this is Alan Menken, and you are listening to Musical Talk. Paul Tibby there, the composer and pianist of Fred and Gladys playing at the Landor Theatre. For more information about everything we talked about in this episode, please go to www.musicaltalk.co.uk. You can visit our Twitter page at twitter.com slash musicaltalk. Please do follow us there. We post lots of fun, interesting, uh, up-to-the-minute reviews of things we see, and Andrew posts as well, and it's, it's very fun. Uh, or Facebook, facebook.com slash musicaltalk talk of course for that please do like us or fan us or follow us or whatever it is you kids are doing nowadays with your with your interwebs and stuff like that thank you very much for listening to this lovely episode of musical talk we'll see you next week bye this episode of musical talk was presented and edited by nick hudson and andrew keating copyright 2011